All right, our lecture today is on the cerebral cortex. Um, just wanted to let you know that, um, as always, not all of the lectures fit nicely into a one-hour block. Uh, for example, the limbic system lectures were um, quite a bit shorter than two hours. Um, this one will be a little bit longer, and uh, there'll also be a few more test questions on this than in just you know, a one-hour block. So just wanted to uh, give you a little heads up about that. Now this is a very important topic. I think many of the step one, step two questions um, are just straightforward. Do you know what this area of the brain does and uh, what sort of problems will occur with lesions? So remember when we think of the cerebral cortex, um, we're talking about this thin ribbon of neurons here out around the surface. Okay, and in our previous lectures we've covered the deep white matter um, structures, and also the deeply located neuronal masses like the caudate, putamen, and thalamus. Okay, but today we'll be talking about the cortex. And we've covered quite a few of these areas already, so I'm not going to repeat um, all of that in detail. Um, I'll just mention them here very uh, briefly. So in terms of frontal lobe, we've talked about Broca's area um, here on the uh, inferior uh, frontal gyrus, so this is for um, expressive language. Uh, we've uh, talked about what a lesion there looks like in terms of an expressive aphasia. The frontal eye fields are about in this area in the middle frontal gyrus, and we've drawn out um, how that relates to uh, eye movements. And then the primary motor cortex, of course, is back here on the precentral um, gyrus. We've also said that um, there are areas of the frontal lobe um, here in prefrontal cortex that have uh, different roles. So the, the frontal poles, this area here in blue, um, is, uh, mediates what we call metacognitive uh, function. So this involves um, self-awareness, but also uh, being perceptive to the emotions of others. And so I just mentioned that if you have lesions here, then you have patients who lose that perception of how someone else is doing. Um, so they can't put themselves in someone else's shoes, so to speak, and they have impaired empathy. They're also rather poor at recognizing the subtle facial expressions of others. Um, you know, we're normally quite good at that, especially, you know, in a family, you recognize right away by a little eyebrow lift or something, whether someone is a bit um, irritated. But patients, for example, that have had head trauma that involves the frontal poles, they just sort of lose that um, uh, ability to recognize how others are doing. We've also mentioned very briefly here the dorsal and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And uh, we're going to say more about this area. This is very important for several things we'll cover in the lecture today. But previously, we've mentioned these areas are important for task setting and monitoring um, and working memory. So these are all things that students need to be very good at. You come up with a, um, a task, you know, for a course, a plan for how you're going to study, um, but then you need to monitor your progress as you go along. Are you keeping up with your goals? And working memory will be a, a subject in this lecture that we'll talk about, and that is a function um, largely here of the dorsolateral um, prefrontal cortex. We've also mentioned two other areas here, the superior medial prefrontal cortex and this more anterior portion of the cingulate gyrus. And so these are important for energizing, okay? And so you can just remember sort of getting the mental clutch out of neutral to motivate you to, you know, step out and do something. And so if we have lesions here, and they usually tend to be bilateral lesions, then we have patients who um, seem rather withdrawn, um, lack emotion, so they can have apathy. Abulia is kind of a without joy, uh, these patients have no melody to their speech. They're just a very flat affect. And a severe form would be akinetic mutism, where patients can even appear um, in a coma. They're just not responding at all. Okay, so 
here is this superior medial portion. And remember the cingulate gyrus here lies on top of the corpus callosum. So for energizing, it's the more anterior portion that's involved there. Then we have the undersurface of the frontal lobe. And so this is the orbital frontal cortex. All right, and this area of the frontal lobe is important for behavioral and emotional regulation and also social cognition. And so not surprising here when we have lesions of the orbital frontal cortex, uh, we have a behavioral, emotional uh, dysfunction. And so this mainly manifests as a disinhibited patient. So there's no filter. Uh, they're making inappropriate comments about women, uh, racial jokes, um, and so on. And so a disinhibited feature with lesions here. Um, interestingly, these patients often have hyperphagia, um, an addiction often to sweets, uh, often a particular kind of sweet, M&Ms, Oreos, and they'll gain weight, and you know that can be uh, problematic. And frequently, they have an environmental dependency. So when you see these patients just coming in, uh, they're maybe making an inappropriate or aggressive comment, um, and then they may just have a need to touch their environment. Okay, and um, next year when we talk about different dementia syndromes, um, we'll talk about uh, some of these that tend to involve this area of the brain. Moving back to the parietal lobe, uh, which we haven't covered in a lot of detail. We've mainly talked about the postcentral gyrus, all right, for sensation. And in this lecture, we will say a bit more, especially about the angular gyrus and the importance of that. Uh, just remember the homunculus for both the motor and the sensory strips. So you need to remember that the face and the lips, huge representation here in the lateral surface, big representation for the hand, especially here for motor, and then the leg is midline. All right, on the temporal lobe, we have back here, Wernicke's area. Okay, so this is the receptive language area. Okay, it does extend a little bit into the parietal lobe, but its most important function here is on the uh, superior temporal gyrus. Deep to that, we have Heschel's gyrus, which we can see right here in number four. If you just put your fingers in the sylvian fissure, they rest there on Heschel's gyrus. And so this is right next to Wernicke's area. So this is primary auditory cortex. Makes sense they're right next to each other, right? You hear the sound, and then the interpretive language of the brain, Wernicke's area, um, is immediately adjacent. On the undersurface of the brain, we have colored here in um, orange the uh, uncus. So this is primary olfactory cortex. And adjacent to it, in this lecture, we will talk um, about the parahippocampal gyrus. And it's a very important uh, function for uh, memory. It's also part of the limbic system. And the occipital lobe, of course, um, we have around the calcarine sulcus, primary visual cortex. And in this lecture, we will talk about um, visual processing and how other areas of the brain help you to interpret the vision that you see. And so here's a nice drawing that a fourth year student completed for me just a few weeks ago. And I think this would be a good one just to go back at the end of the lecture and review and make sure that uh, you're familiar with um, all of these areas. I will say very little here about histology, um, but uh, there, are, there are three different types of cortex in the brain. More than 90% is neocortex, okay? Um, but there's also a paleocortex that refers just to olfactory and an architect cortex, which refers to the hippocampal formations. And uh, I will show you a little picture of um, what the hippocampus looks like. But in terms of the neocortex, not much that I care you know about this. So we have the superficial layers one, two, and three here. Um, layers four and six uh, communicate with the thalamus. And so remember all sensory information, um, whether it's vision or sound or touch, um, all needs to go through the thalamus. And so we have this communication back and forth from layers four and six with the thalamus. Layer five, 
um, maybe the most important uh, point here in terms of layers of the cortex, the larger pyramidal cells are located here, and these make up our um, uh, descending upper motor neuron pathways like the cortical spinal tract, cortical bulbar tract here would originate from layer five. So we'll spend some time talking about memory. Memory is a very complex, uh, but understanding the normal anatomy of memory um, can help us make sense of conditions that impair memory. So memory, maybe obviously, is the ability to capture, store, and then later retrieve the information. Um, memory is not a function of one area of the brain. These are huge neuronal networks. Some areas are more important than others. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit, but there isn't just one memory part of the brain. So we will divide memory into two big categories. Declarative memory refers to uh, consciously evoked memories, things that you consciously remember. Um, and so we'll talk a lot about episodic memory, a little bit about semantic memory, okay? And then we'll, we'll come to non-declarative memories, and these are not consciously evoked. So, for example, um, the ability to ride a bike. Um, that's just something, once you know how to do it, it's natural. It's not a consciously evoked memory when you get on a bike and, okay, how do I move this foot forward and, and so on. So episodic memory um, is the ability to consciously retrieve past personal episodes or experiences. These are memories you have of things that you have done, places that you've been. And so it's uh, strongly linked to self and time. And to a certain extent, epi episodic memories, um, you remember these things. There's an emotional component. You're a little bit relive the experience um, in an episodic memory. So just an example, you know, um, I went to Delhi Palace a few weeks ago, and so it was a Sunday, and I could tell you about what time it was and even uh, what we ate, and so that's a, a relived experience. That would be an example of an episodic memory. Um, or you got a gift for, um, you know, your 20th birthday, and so maybe you remember what restaurant you were at and who, who gave that to you. Uh, that would be another example um, of an episodic memory. Okay, so these are autobiographical memories. And the anatomy of this most important uh, area um, that coordinates with many other areas of the brain but for episodic memory, it's the medial temporal lobe. And from now on, when I say medial temporal lobe, I mean the uh, hippocampal formations and the entorhinal cortex. Okay, so episodic memory is a medial temporal lobe function. And so this is very uh, complex what happens. Um, and I've tried to uh, simplify this. Of course, it's not uh, perfectly understood. But it appears what happens is that the medial temporal lobe um, links an initial trace, what we call a trace of information from many diffuse areas of the brain. Okay, and it then holds that information for a short period of time. Um, now they, that may just be minutes or hours, days or even weeks. So that varies quite a bit. But the goal in sort of holding this trace information is to allow it to be processed and later transferred to areas um, in the cerebral cortex for permanent long-term storage. All right, so remember the hippocampus here is this kind of a curly Q shape uh, in the medial temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe, the whole thing right here. Okay, so it's in the medial temporal lobe. You can't really see the entorhinal cortex, but it's sort of the gateway here in and out of the um, hippocampus. All right, so there are three sort of stages of laying down memories. The first is just encoding the information. And all three of these stages, uh, we have areas of the brain that are intimately linked with the medial temporal lobe. And so encoding um, appears to primarily involve the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, and again, communicating here with the 
medial temporal lobe, hippocampus, interrhinal cortex. Okay, next we have uh, the consolidation and storage. And this involves association cortex of the brain. And in just a minute, I'm gonna tell you what association cortex is. And um, consolidation of memories and storage, it's modality specific, meaning um, memories that are more of a verbal nature would involve the usually the left hemisphere and the uh, related to the language areas of the brain, like Wernicke's area, whereas visual spatial memories um, would be predominantly right hemisphere, right hippocampus, verbal left hemisphere, left hippocampus. And just to give you one example, a fascinating study years ago of Lung London taxi cab drivers. Um, I was in London about a year and a half ago, enormously complicated, the streets and, you know, obviously such a huge city. And not surprisingly, experienced London taxi cab drivers had a very um, much more synaptic density and volume in the right hippocampus. Now, this is switched around from how we're normally looking at an MRI scan, um, but they can measure here the activity in the right hippocampus, okay? And to, to have a memory of all of those streets and, and so on uh, involves a lot going on there. There have been interesting studies on medical students um, looking at their brains, um, on a type of MRI scan prior to medical school and after the first year. And um, in that case, much more volume, especially in the left uh, parietal lobe and left hippocampus because of all of the uh, vocabulary um, that you're learning and terminology and so on. And then of course, um, None of this does us any good unless you can also retrieve the information. And that is a function of the association cortex working together with the medial um, temporal lobes. So what is association cortex? Association cortex lies around the primary areas of the brain. So for example, um, here is the precentral gyrus. Okay, that's primary motor cortex. So the association motor cortex lies around it. Likewise, here is primary sensory cortex. Association cortex lies around it. So association cortex has to do with more complex processing and interpretation of information than the primary motor, sensory, or visual areas. So here's primary visual cortex, and we're going to talk about the association cortex that lies around it. Um, here's primary auditory cortex, okay? The association cortex has a more complex function around it. So um, a lot of uh, memories, long-term memories occur in, in these areas of association cortex. And you can see here that um, the, the uh, prefrontal cortex here is association cortex and a large portion here of the parietal and temporal lobes. And so these have to do with higher order uh, cognitive functions as well. I'll say a bit more of that um, here in a little bit. Pape circuit, remember, involves the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus. And so we've already been over the circuit. Um, and so just to show you on our sagittal section, now we can't see the hippocampus here because it's a midline section. But remember, from the hippocampus, it goes through the columns of the fornix down to the mammillary bodies and then up to the cingulate gyrus and then back to the hippocampus again. And on the way from the mammillary bodies, it goes through the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and up to the cingulate gyrus. And so this circuit is important for facilitating the encoding and the storage and the retrieval of information. Um, and this appears to happen through intense stimulation of specific neuronal networks. Again, uh, primarily association cortex. And when we look at the hippocampus here, it's very complex, um, and you don't need to know all of this, but the most important area for episodic memory uh, is what we call CA1. Okay, and I'm gonna give you an example in just a few minutes here of a lesion of CA1, but that seems to be the most uh, significant area for episodic memory. 
So what happens is the hippocampus communicates with uh, association cortex, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex involved in all of this encoding and storage and retrieval of information. But likewise, the cingulate gyrus also communicates with these areas uh, of the cortex. And that also seems to be uh, an important part of uh, memory formation and retrieval. So here's a real nice drawing a student just created showing you Pape's circuit. So here we have the hippocampus, there's the entorhinal cortex, and so from the hippocampus we have the columns of the fornix here that goes down to the mammillary body and then up to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and then up to the cingulate and then back down uh, to the hippocampus again. So let's say a little bit about what can happen with lesions of the medial temporal lobes. So any lesion there or a PAPE circuit will profoundly impair episodic memory. And when we talk about uh, memory dysfunction, that's otherwise known as amnesia, um, there are two types, anterograde and retrograde. Um, anterograde is much more common. That's the inability to form new memories. And so if you have lesions of the medial temporal lobe, PAPE circuit, it's very hard to lay down new memories. Um, Retrograde amnesia refers to um, loss of memory prior to the onset of whatever disease or injury um, occurred to this neuroanatomy. So this would be loss of past memories. Anterograde is inability to form new memories. And so the classic example is patient H.M., who in 1957 uh, had um, his hippocampus, the medial temporal lobe, was resected on both sides because he had intractable epilepsy. And so patients seemed to be doing very well uh, after surgery, um, performed about the same on IQ testing. But because he had lost his medial temporal lobe, he had an inability to lay down new information, and he had a profound anterograde amnesia. Um, he died in 2008, and every day for him was essentially um, uh, starting from scratch. Could not tell you what he had done the day before. I had a profound inability to make episodic memories of, you know, what did you have for dinner last night? That kind of thing. And, and he just would not be able to come up with that information. All right, so we'll say a little more about patient HM, but that's a profound example of medial temporal lobe dysfunction with episodic memory loss, primarily anterograde uh, amnesia. Alzheimer's disease or dementia um, would be our um, by far most common condition that involves the medial temporal lobe. These patients have very early uh, atrophy of the hippocampus. So not surprisingly, they have early on severe, um, or one of the earliest features is anterograde amnesia with relatively preserved um, long-term memory. So they, it's not until very late that they have any retrograde amnesia, All right? So they have poor episodic memory and again, would have a hard time telling you uh, what they had for dinner last night or what you watch What's the last movie you saw? That kind of a thing. Those would all be episodic memories that would be difficult for them. Uh, remember that the right hippocampus, right hemisphere, is more important for visual spatial orientation. And so atrophy of the right hippocampus, um, especially, will impair uh, visual spatial um, skills. So these patients early on get lost driving. Um, you know, maybe they used to be really good with maps and directions, and they just kind of lose that. And in an end stage, patients with Alzheimer's can get lost in their own home. Um, because of the uh, dysfunction of the medial temporal lobe hippocampus, um, learning something new is very challenging. And so um, I've seen many patients, you know, they get a new phone or a, a remote control for the TV or something like that, and they, they just can't begin to understand um, how to work a new device like that.
All right, but at least early on, long-term memories are relatively preserved, which again says that that medial temporal lobe is important for the whole process of getting those long-term memories there in the first place. Okay, once you have them laid down in association cortex, um, patients with Alzheimer's for quite some time into their course can still retrieve those memories very well. So the veterans I see with Alzheimer's, boy, they can give you all kinds of details from 50 years ago, incredible details. But um, their, their recent um, memories are very poor. Uh, semantic memory, which I'll define in just a few minutes, is relatively preserved, and procedural memories are relatively preserved in uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Again, we'll define both of those in just a minute. Here's an MRI scan of a normal individual. All right, so this is the hippocampus right in there. All right, and notice this little white area right here. Look at the cursor. That is the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. Pretty small. Notice that over here, the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle is much bigger. And it's much bigger because there's atrophy here of the hippocampus. So when we see someone with memory loss and we do an MRI scan and we see hippocampal atrophy, uh, that individual has Alzheimer's disease. Now, another condition that affects the neuroanatomy we've been talking about here is Wernicke's encephalopathy. And this is due to thiamine deficiency. But these individuals usually do not have symptoms until they come into the hospital and they're given IV glucose. And that precipitates an acute um, thiamine deficiency. And I'm not gonna go into the biochemistry, but um, these are individuals maybe come in for a hip surgery or something like that, and they're given some IV glucose maybe after the surgery, and then they all of a sudden just decompensate. And classically, patients with Wernicke's encephalopathy have a triad. Now, just in the name, you can see the word encephalopathy, so that's confusion, right? And so that relates to our topic here today. They're confused. Now, they also tend to have a very profound eye movement abnormality. Remember, ophthalmoplegia is just a big word for an eye movement problem. Um, it usually looks sort of like a bilateral six nerve palsy, but can take many different forms. Um, and they have profound gait instability. This is really a gait uh, ataxia, so they're very unsteady. So you have these patients that came in normal to the hospital, and then all of a sudden they're very confused. And if you do an MRI scan in these patients, here we can see the midbrain, and look at these hyperintensities here in the mammillary bodies. Okay, so this is part of PAPE circuit, and not surprisingly then, these patients are very confused. Okay, now, a syndrome that can occur out of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Um, now, ideally, you obviously diagnose this, and you give the patient IV thiamine, and within hours, the eye movements are back to normal. It's just really miraculous. It takes a little bit longer for the confusion and the walking um, to improve. But if thiamine deficiency is not treated and it goes on for a period of time, it can evolve into what is known as Korsakoff syndrome or Korsakoff's dementia. Uh, this is a very unique uh, dementia syndrome because it's not just anterograde amnesia, but these patients also have retrograde amnesia, um, which means they have these big gaps in their memory for things that happened decades ago, okay? And so they've just lost big patches of memory from a long time ago, and they don't have much insight um, into this at all. And they're fascinating patients to talk to because they have these invented memories to fill in the gaps, okay? They're not, you know, trying to be deceptive or anything like that, um, but uh, they're fascinating patients to talk to. Um, years ago, uh, we had a patient at the VA with this, and our inpatient team would come by every morning, and I would just ask the patient, uh, do I know you from somewhere? And uh, one day, he knew me from when he grew up in Minnesota, and then the next day, he had some other memory of something that we had done together. And so all of these sort of invented memories are what's known as confabulation. 
and that is a classic feature of Korsakoff's syndrome. Again, the outflow of thiamine deficiency that's not corrected. Now, another uh, very interesting uh, syndrome is called transient global amnesia. And so this is the condition that selectively uh, here involves the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And so these are usually bilateral CA1 lesions. Uh, this is an area of the hippocampus that is especially susceptible to cellular metabolic stress. And uh, very often the mechanism of this is what we call venous congestion. Uh, the last two patients I've seen with transient global amnesia, uh, one occurred, uh, he was on uh, narcotic medications for pain, which caused constipation. And so he was straining to have a bowel movement and, um, you know, had this sort of a valsalva increased intrathoracic pressure, and that led to venous congestion up into the CA1 region of the hippocampus, and he became acutely very confused. Um, I've seen this, uh, another recent one was right after sexual activity, uh, so some sort of a Valsalva maneuver um, uh, can bring this on. So these patients have profound anterograde amnesia. They're very confused, they're very distressed by it. And so the classic feature of transient global amnesia is these patients will just ask questions over and over. What's going on? What's going on? What's happening to me? Why, what are, why are we here? And so they ask these questions over and over again. Fortunately, it lasts usually less than 12 hours, um, often six hours, and then patients are back to normal. But if you do an MRI scan, now our resolution is so good with these MRIs. Here we can see the midbrain here. And so the hippocampus is in this area, and here is CA1 right there. And you can see these tiny little kind of uh, uh, hyperintense uh, spots that show up there in the C CA1. And these patients, though, recover completely uh, back to normal. So um, that gives you a few examples of conditions that affect episodic memory. Um, how could you test this? Well, you could just ask the patient some recent autobiographical information. Again, what did you have for dinner last night? Uh, what did you do last week? What's the last movie that you saw? Those kinds of questions. Or you can ask patients uh, current news information. Um, of course, all anyone is talking about now is coronavirus, COVID-19. And um, so uh, it would not surprise me at all if I were to see an Alzheimer's patient. Um, you know, maybe the news is on all day long. And so I would ask, well, what's going on in the news? And maybe there'd be a little awareness of, yeah, there's something going on with the virus, but uh, really quite poor at taking in uh, that new information, processing it, and coming back with a meaningful um, explanation of, of things that they've seen recently on the news. Um, you can check for more verbal episodic memory by giving the patient three or four words. You may have to repeat it a few times so that they get it, tell them to remember it, and then ask them in five or 10 minutes, can you tell me those uh, three or four words again? If you want to check more visual, spatial, right hemisphere, episodic memory, um, we can give a patient some shapes to remember. And I like the penny hiding test, where I'll take three pennies, I'll tell the patient, I'm gonna hide these, and I want you to remember in a few minutes where I put them. So I'll put one under my keyboard, uh, another one on a bookshelf, and one on the uh, window ledge. Patient will see where they are, and then I'll ask them uh, five minutes later, where did I put those pennies? And again, in Alzheimer's, with that visual spatial uh, sort of disorientation, um, they'll be kind of vague. I think you put it somewhere over there in the corner, but they can't tell you specifically uh, where you put the penny. Um, another test is called the three words, three shapes test. And this actually tests um, really everything we've talked about so far. So you will give these patients these three words with the three shapes. Okay, and frequently you'll need to repeat this a number of times, which really does test the whole thing, the encoding, the storage and consolidation. And then, you know, if you ask them 10 minutes later to 
uh, reproduce this, uh, that's the retrieval uh, mechanism. Okay, so um, this is a challenge again, especially with Alzheimer's as it gets uh, more prominent. All right, so that's one example of a declarative memory, consciously evoked memory. Um, semantic memory is quite different. This is just general knowledge, facts, concepts, words, and their meaning. Um, unlike episodic memory, this does not have an, much of an autobiographical or a time aspect. For example, um, we all know that George Washington is the first president of the United States, but I'll bet very few of you can remember when you learned that for the first time. Okay, so um, this is kind of a difference between episodic and semantic memory, just things that you know, um, but there's not much of a, you know, an emotional, a specific time, you know, when you learn that information. So how many weeks in a year? What's the capital of Oregon? Uh, what does Indian food taste like? You know, there could, there could be some episodic, you know, memory component to that, but these are just like facts and things that you know, um, or opinions, and uh, quite different than episodic memory. But the two are closely linked, and I'm sorry here to harp on Indian food, but um, uh, just to, to show how these two can be interrelated. So semantic memory would be, okay, I think Indian food is filling, spicy, uh, or whatever you know belief you have about um, Indian food. That's a semantic memory. But every time you re-experience that food, maybe you have something different that you know surprises you a little bit. Um, that's an episodic memory. Boy, last week we went there and you know I had um, the dessert or something like that. Um, but that's going to inform your semantic memory. Right, so your opinion of what Indian food is like um, is shaped by the episodic memory. So we can't make these entirely too separately distinct. Um, they're they're interrelated, closely related, uh, episodic and semantic memory. Now the neuroanatomy. The the main point here is the semantic memory is not the medial temporal lobes. It's anterior lateral inferior, but it's not medial. Okay, so. Um, that will be significant here, especially when we uh, give Alzheimer's as an example. So um, they're modality specific, okay, just like with episodic memory. So more word-related memories, your knowledge of just vocabulary and words would be more uh, related to language areas in the left hemisphere. More action-related memories would be closer to uh, motor cortex. So patient HM, who remember had bilateral medial temporal lobectomies, okay? And so his episodic memory was very poor, but his semantic memory was good, okay? So you could ask him, you know, presidents, capitals, uh, all sorts of semantic memory, and that was preserved, but it was episodic memory um, that was knocked out. So Alzheimer's dementia, early on semantic memory uh, is good in these patients, all right? But the whole brain is affected in Alzheimer's dementia. And so eventually they will have some uh, semantic memory loss as well. And so what does that look like? Well, they lose a basic knowledge of words and objects, okay? And so their vocabulary kind of shrinks. They have uh, anomia. And so rather than saying, I have a golden retriever, um, I've, I've observed this a number of times, the patient will say, I have a dog. Um, or they'll want to say, could you give me that, uh, whatever it is, um, you know, they want to say the doorknob or something over there, and, and they will instead say that thing. Okay, so the kind of a shrinking of vocabulary. Um, also, just a knowledge of objects. Um, I had a patient with uh, Alzheimer's not too long ago, and his wife said he keeps putting his shaving cream on the toothpaste. Um, so just a basic loss of knowledge of object, objects and their function. So we can test semantic memory by just general knowledge questions, presidents, capitals, that kind of thing. Um, I'll ask a patient uh, to tell me uh, 
give me as many islands as you can, name them in one minute, or name as many animals as you can in one minute. That would be testing semantic memory. And we know normal values uh, depending on how old you are for those kinds of things. Okay, to check more uh, vocabulary, um, I like to point to objects in the room. So often something that is a name, it's a little more difficult, like a fluorescent light. Um, they won't be able to say that or point to a door hinge. That might be challenging. Phonetically irregular words can be difficult. So if we have them read something, uh, words like yacht and kernel um, are, would be difficult with a more advanced uh, semantic memory loss. There is a very specific condition in neurology that knocks out semantic memory, but it's so rare uh, you'd never be tested on it. So I've decided not to go into that in detail. All right, now working memory. Working memory is something that is uh, functioning very well uh, for anyone who has made it into medical school. Working memory is the ability to hold, sort of juggle, uh, process and manipulate information for a short period of time. And so just sitting in a lecture, you hear a sentence, it's maybe a little challenging. You've got to incorporate that with what you just learned before. So that kind of man holding, manipulating of information in real time uh, is working memory. Okay, so an example, you're given a phone number with an area code and you've got to quickly try to mentally rehearse and remember that number. That would be an example of uh, working memory. So what's the anatomy of working memory? The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, we know is uh, the most active part of the brain um, during uh, working memory. And working memory is lumped into what we call an executive function of the brain. And when we use that term, that's so, sort of a goal-oriented, drive-adaptive behavior. So I've given you some examples. Um, what do we mean by executive function? Just the ability to think flexibly and to make good decisions, um, to plan and adjust, task setting, self-monitoring. Again, uh, to come up with a plan for your life or for the day, and then just to check and monitor how you're doing with that plan. And also to inhibit irrelevant information. Patients that have problems, maybe head trauma that involves the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, they have a hard time just shutting out things that are irrelevant. Okay, if you have really strong working memory, you can focus and you can you know, just do what needs to be done and you shut out the irrelevant um, stimuli. So patients that have problems with working memory appear to be poorly focused, somewhat absent-minded. Um, many, many things can cause uh, impairment with working memory. So metabolic encephalopathy is very common. Um, so remember this refers to uh, hundreds and hundreds of things that can uh, affect how the brain functions. So, and they're metabolic. So like a patient has an infection or maybe a drug overdose, or alcohol, um, liver failure, renal failure. All of these things affect how the cortex of the brain works. Okay, and so in this case, mainly the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and will impair working memory. If we have a stroke in that area, head trauma, or some neurodegenerative process, including Alzheimer's, um, then working memory uh, is affected. So we can test this by giving a patient um, digits. So we'll give them three, four, five, have them repeat back. The average person can repeat um, seven digits, but it's plus or minus two. So I don't know how helpful that is. That's a pretty big range. But we can also test working memory by having the patient start from 100 and subtract seven and keep going back. And so Problem, patients with a problem with working memory, they might say, okay, 100, 93, 86, 81. Um, what was it you wanted me to subtract it by again? You know, so they lose that kind of the task setting and monitoring uh, that's a part of um, uh, working memory. We can ask the patient to spell the word world and then spell it backwards. And then I've already shown you um, the test where we have a patient draw alternating squares 
and triangles. And so the patient here starts out doing pretty well. Oh, but then they forget and they draw two triangles, two squares, and now three triangles. Okay, this is what we'd see in a metabolic encephalopathy patient and uh, impaired working memory. Now, procedural memory, this is a non-declarative memory, meaning it's not consciously uh, evoked. And so this refers to a memory for motor skills, all right? So riding a bike, texting, handwriting, playing a musical instrument, um, you know, could give hundreds of examples here of procedural memory. And the neuroanatomy of this is very different. So the supplementary cortex which here on a sagittal section we can see in purple. So this is the paracentral lobule back here. And so it's just anterior to that. You can see it a little bit over here uh, as well. So the supplementary motor cortex is very involved in procedural memory, but also not surprisingly the basal ganglia and cerebellum, which are you know, very involved in movement. And so patients with Parkinson's disease, for example, may lose procedural memory and some of these skills for um, uh, certain motor activities will be impaired in these patients. So let's come back to patient HM. Remember, medial temporal lobe, hippocampus was removed. And so he was uh, given a task, which was quite creative, I think, to uh, test this, uh, which was uh, to draw a star while looking in a mirror. And if you ever tried that, it's challenging. You can learn how to do it, but it takes a little while. So he wasn't very good at first, like most of us, you know, wouldn't be very good. Um, but, you know, he got better, better at it with practice. Now, interestingly, the next day, he was asked to do the same thing. And because he had a complete loss of episodic memory, he didn't remember that he had tried to do this before. Um, but he was better at it the second day. Third day, he was given the same task, had no memory that he'd ever done this before, but he was pretty good at it. And with subsequent days, um, he became very good at this task, even though he had no memory of ever having done it before. So this is a good example of how a lesion of the medial temporal lobe can profoundly affect one aspect of memory, um, episodic, but completely spare another aspect of memory, which is procedural. All right, so that's all we'll say about memory. A um, few other areas I want to cover in this lecture. One is visual processing. So we've talked about how vision gets back to the occipital lobe, but the rest of the brain is really what interprets uh, what is happening back here. So amazingly, 50% of the brain is involved in visual processing. And so here, I'm going to show some details in the picture, but I really don't care that you know these details. I just want you to get the big uh, picture here. So we have retinal gangly, um, ganglion cells that, remember this goes back through the optic nerve chiasm and tract to the lateral geniculate nucleus here. And really the only thing, point I'm trying to make out of this slide is that there are two separate pathways um, one are called M-type cells uh, that go to the lateral geniculate. This is the M pathway. And this is what we call the where of vision. Where are things? This has to do with motion, spatial analysis. Okay, a separate pathway from retinal ganglia cells to the lateral geniculate is called the P-type pathway, P-pathway. And this involves the what of vision. What is it that I'm looking at? The form, the shape ability to recognize faces and color. And so these two pathways all the way back to the occipital lobe are segregated all the way back. Okay, so again, you don't need to know the layers um, that these synapse in the lateral geniculate. I just want you to know they're two separate, distinct, parallel pathways that have to do with the what and where of vision. And so, um, again, they have very specific areas in the lateral geniculate where they synapse. So that vision then goes back to the occipital lobe. And the what of vision goes from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe. 
Okay, so remember, this is the P pathway projections here. And so occipital temporal connections, bilateral, have to do with identifying faces, letters, symbols, and objects. And I am amazed at how um, incredible our brains are with, with some of these functions. Um, so I graduated from high school, what, 36 years ago? And a few years ago on campus, I walked by someone who I didn't even know very well in high school, and we immediately both recognized each other and had a little conversation. And that's, you know, more than 30 years of uh, someone that I didn't really know that well. But yet the subtle changes of the nose and the face, even over time, and you recognize someone. So our brain is very good at sort of encoding um, that information, the, the subtle differences of a face. Um, the what pathway also is important for color processing. All right, so let's say we have a lesion, and it usually is bilateral, that impairs occipital temporal connections. Here we have a patient, you can see this bright spot right there, that's a clot in the basilar artery. And so here we see a stroke in this sort of midline portion of the temporal lobe. Uh, you don't need to know this, but it's called the fusiform gyrus. Okay, and you can't really see it on this side, but there is a bilateral stroke that impairs the connection between the occipital lobe and the temporal lobes. Okay, and so what kind of problems do these patients have? They have, uh, one is called a general visual agnosia. And again, this is just an impaired what of visual function. So we give these patients shapes, and they're quite poor at identifying a square, a rectangle, a star, and, and so on. Um, I had a patient uh, a few years ago who was a used car salesman, and so we just showed him a picture of different vehicles. And he could tell you all about a Mercedes and a BMW and all of that, but when faced with an actual picture of them, he said they all look about the same. Okay, this is an impairment in the what, the interpretation of what it is uh, that you're looking at. Okay, a very specific uh, type of visual agnosia is called prosopagnosia. And again, the lesion is bilateral, the a disconnect between the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe on both sides. So prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize faces. Uh, Oliver Sacks has a book with a whole section on this uh, called the, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Okay, and so patients have very poor facial recognition. Also, they're not very good at recognizing someone's ethnicity or age. Um, I've seen several patients with this, and they tell me, um, you know, I sure recognize your voice, but you just don't look familiar, Dr. Cole. So that's prosopagnosia. So if they are into Hollywood or movies at all, they, they know all the celebrities, but then you show them pictures of celebrities and they can't identify them very well. Um, so again, a personal experience I had, a big Laker fan who had a stroke and he could talk about all the Lakers and Laker greats, but we brought out a picture of Kobe Bryant that was his favorite player and he didn't look familiar uh, to him. So profound example of prosopagnosia. Also, remember color processing is involved in the what of vision, all right? So you show a patient a picture like this and they will just say, wow, oh, they're all kind of gray or black and white. Okay, so that's called a dyschromatopsia. If it's complete, we call it achromatopsia. All right, another example of this is a syndrome called alexia without agraphia. This has a high yield for board exams, so make sure you know this one. Alexia without agraphia occurs when we have a left posterior cerebral artery stroke. So remember, anytime we're looking at CT or MRI, you have to imagine the patient's lying on their back, feet coming out towards you. So this stroke is in the left posterior cerebral artery distribution. And so these patients can see words in the right occipital lobe, okay? But you don't read in the occipital lobe. You read in Wernicke's area. And so to interpret what they see, 
that has to get all the way over here to Wernicke's area. And so the problem is when you have a stroke here and the PCA not only supplies the occipital lobe, some of the temporal lobe, but it also supplies the splenium, which we really don't see here, the crossing fibers. And so vision is just kind of isolated here. It can't get to the areas in the temporal lobe to interpret it. And so these patients cannot read, they have alexia. But they don't have agraphia because the ability to write has nothing to do with vision. All of you could close your eyes, or has very little to do with vision. You could close your eyes and write sentences, and they're pretty legible. And so uh, these patients are fascinating because they can write sentences. I have them write like five sentences, no problem. And then you ask them to come back and read what they just wrote, and they can't. Okay, so that is alexia without agraphia. We don't see this with a right PCA stroke. Now I'm assuming someone's language dominant in the left hemisphere, because if your stroke is on this side, well, the words now are getting into the left occipital lobe, which is immediately adjacent to Wernicke's area. So here they can read just fine. All right, so here is my attempt to draw this out. All right, so we're looking down on top of the left occipital lobe. So we have a left PCA stroke that extends here to involve the splenium of the corpus callosum. So the patient has alexia. They can see the words, but they can't get the words over to Wernicke's area to read. But they don't have agraphia because if we tell these patients, please write today is a sunny day. Well, that's an auditory command you would hear in Heschel's gyrus right adjacent to Wernicke's area. And then you can just move that forward to motor cortex and you can write the sentence down. So it's alexia without agraphia. Now, what if we have lesions here, all right? And this is the wear of vision, all right? So where are things? Spatial relationships, motion. Okay, that goes from the occipital lobe bilaterally to the parietal lobe. And usually we need to have bilateral lesions back here to uh, impair this function. Um, we'll talk about in the second year neuroscience course some conditions here that can affect bilateral sort of, um, here you can see we've kind of disconnected the occipital lobes from the parietal lobes here. And so this is what is known as Balance syndrome. Okay, and so this has a triad. Um, first, these patients have optic ataxia. And so we would test this just like you do finger to nose testing. And you might think this patient has ataxia. They're sort of reaching out for your finger. And because they've lost the wear of things, they sort of move their head around and they're very poor. It can look like an ataxia. You, you're thinking it's a cerebellar lesion. But we can distinguish it from a cerebellar ataxia because if we ask the patient, touch your nose, touch your chin, touch your shoulder, they have no problem doing that because those things, touching yourself in different places, um, uh, is not a feature of the wear of vision. You know, you could close your eyes and touch all of those areas. If you have someone with cerebellar ataxia, when they try to touch their nose, they're also going to be um, unsteady, right? So the first is optic ataxia. Um, the next one is a little hard to explain, but it's called oculomotor apraxia. And this has the ability just to look around in space accurately. When we have these patients sort of follow our finger with their eyes, they're very poor at tracking. Okay, again, because they can't localize things, the where. Oftentimes, if we're having them look back and forth, they have to actually blink their eyes to get their eyes to move from one side to the other. Oculomotor apraxia is not a great term, but that's kind of what we're stuck with for that. And then I think most interestingly, uh, these patients have simultagnosia, um, which may be better described as a lack of global capture. Okay, we can all look at a scene. You walk into a room, you can take the whole thing in, in pretty quickly. But if you've lost the wear of vision, the wear of visual processing, you can only take in one little part of the scene, not the whole thing. And so it's an outdated picture, but this is what most neurologists still use, is you'll show patients this picture, 
Um, of the woman uh, here washing dishes, and obviously the water's overflowing, the boy is trying to get a cookie, and he's about to get an epidural hematoma, and so there's a lot going on in this picture. But when you so show patients with Balint syndrome this picture, they can just take in one little bit of it, and they will say, well, uh, there's a lady washing dishes. Okay, what else do you see? Um, well they won't be able to add much to it, or it'll take them a long time to sort of scan the picture and put the whole thing together. So that's simultagnosia, again, a lack of global capture. We can also, also show these patients um, Navon letters, and so if you show a patient with Balint syndrome, something like this, they will say, I see an E, but they won't be able to put the whole thing quickly together and, and see that it's the letter A, uh, made out of E's. Or paintings like this that are made out of vegetables. All right, we see a face, but someone with Balint syndrome looking at this would say, I see an onion. Well, what else do you see? Um, they might look around a little bit, I see a carrot or something like that, but, but they can't take the whole thing in. All right, another very important function, again, high yield here, is attention and arousal for visual fields. And very important, you hear me on this here, we're not talking about uh, the ability to see in the visual fields, okay? So here we're really not talking about vision. We're talking about attention and arousal for both visual fields. And notice the difference here. The left hemisphere has a tension and arousal for the right visual field, whereas the right hemisphere has a tension and arousal for both visual fields. Okay, so now let's say we have a patient with a left hemisphere stroke. There's the lesion right there. Well, this patient will have a lot of other problems, but they won't have difficulty with attention and arousal for both visual fields. So the right hemisphere is able to do that for both sides. Okay, now let's say we have a patient now with a right hemisphere stroke, and it's usually in the parietal lobe. Well, the left hemisphere has attention and arousal for the right side of space, but the right hemisphere does not have attention and arousal for the left side of space. So they have what's called a left-sided neglect. So this is unique for right hemisphere lesions. So again, it's usually parietal lobe, and since the middle cerebral artery supplies this, um, we see this in patients that have a right MCA stroke. All right, so left MCA stroke, we said, all the language, the aphasia, that's affected. Right MCA stroke, we see these very unique and different findings. Okay, the first is known as anosognosia. Uh, anosognosia is the denial of illness. And so um, these patients, you know, they had a stroke, they can't move, left side of their body, they've got all kinds of problems. And you ask them, how are you? And they'll say, oh, I'm fine. I didn't want to come in, but my family made me come in. I, I think I just got the flu or something. Okay, so they lose insight and awareness. Um, the next feature is asomatosognosia. And this refers to um, loss of awareness of the involved body parts. So if you've got a right MCA stroke, you're going to have left-sided weakness. And so um, I've seen this many times. You'll have the patient, you'll hold up their left hand, which they can't move very well, and you'll ask them, whose hand is that? And uh, they will frequently say, well, that's your hand, doctor. They will deny um, their own body parts on the, the left side. Okay, they also, because they don't have attention and arousal for the left side of space, they have a contralateral hemispatial neglect. And so we'll ask a patient to draw a clock, and they have no attention and arousal for the left side. So they put all the numbers on the right side. Uh, this patient is asked to draw a face. Notice the relative lack of details on the left side. Or here to draw a house or a flower. Almost everything is on the right side. Okay, so that's hemispatial neglect. And then finally, they may have extinction. 
and we do this, we touch a patient on the right side, right arm, and they'll say, yeah, I feel that. And we'll touch them on the left side and they'll say, yeah, I can feel that too. And then we'll touch them on both sides together at the same time and they will have extinction for the left side. Okay, so these are all features of an acute right parietal lesion. Um, usually this is intense for like a week or so, but then it clears up pretty well. All right, last thing I want to tell you in this lecture is about the angular gyrus, which we can see right here in orange. And uh, for this, uh, I just want to consider the dominant hemisphere angular gyrus. So again, usually the left hemisphere. And here's a patient with a left middle cerebral artery stroke that would involve the uh, angular gyrus. So this is just posterior to Wernicke's area, okay? And a lesion here results in a very unique syndrome that you would never be able to predict. It's called Gerstmann's syndrome. Okay, and so Gerstmann syndrome, these patients have four rather distinctive findings. And again, uh, high yield for you to remember these. First, they have right-left confusion. So this is an area of the brain that's important for distinguishing what's on the right, what's on the left. Um, and so for these patients, if you ask them, uh, hold up your right hand, well, they may hold up their left hand. Another feature of Gerstmann's is finger agnosia. Uh, this is actually part of the brain where you identify your fingers. And so a very quick test we could do for Gerstmann's to check two of these is we could have, have the patient uh, ask them, please hold up the index finger on your left hand. Okay, well, they can't identify their fingers and they've mixed up right and left. So they might hold up the thumb on their right hand. Okay, another feature of Gerstmann's is these patients have acalculia, which is um, an acute, uh, inability to do math. And actually the very first patient I ever saw with Gerstmann syndrome was a calculus teacher. And he came into the emergency room just somewhat confused. And his exam wasn't very focal and so we did some cognitive testing and I remember he couldn't add 18 plus 14. And this is for a calculus teacher. Okay, so math is not just in one area of the brain, but angular gyrus certainly would be an important area for math function. And then finally, they have agraphia. Here's a patient with Gerstmann syndrome trying to copy this down here. You can see it very poor. Same thing here. Um, we've asked the patient to write the time with a big hand and a little hand. You know, just not a normal drawing. And the handwriting is also very poor. All right, so these are all of the features for Gerstmann syndrome. And so you need to remember that this is on the dominant hemisphere. So again, usually left hemisphere, angular gyrus. All right, so those are the a um, little bit about the cerebral cortex and certain cortical syndromes that can occur uh, with dysfunction. Okay, take care.